A new landmark paper was just published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition titled The Carbohydrate Insulin Model, A Physiological Perspective on the Obesity Pandemic. Now, is this just another paper trying to say carbohydrate insulin model is better, we win, our side has the truth, your side doesn't? Or is this an exploration of trying to figure out why some people get obese in different ways or in different percentages or more likely to or less likely to? Is it a way to try and unpack this whole mess of nutrition that has gotten into these like camps and these wars? Well, I think it's the latter and I'd like to explain it a little bit more and go into a little deeper dive here. I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com. And the first thing to point out about this paper is that sure, there are people who are, there are authors who have been long proponents of carbohydrate insulin model and long proponents of low carb nutrition, but they aren't the only authors. There are also authors who have been involved in the US dietary guidelines. There are authors who, who believe in epidemiology and whole grains and fruits and vegetables, right? There's, there's a mix of people who authored this paper, which is one of the, the most exciting parts to start, that it really was trying to sort of bridge the gap and bring in people from different areas. But as you go through the paper, I think it's clear that they're not trying to say like, we win, we're better, right? They're really trying to to lay out the the whole framework of what this what this minefield of obesity and nutrition looks like. So we have to acknowledge the energy um, the energy balance model, the calories in, calories out model. And I think they did a great job of saying that. Look, the the first law of thermo, thermodynamics holds true, right? We're not saying that's false. Uh, in order to lose weight, you need to burn more calories than you bring in. But that's Although that may be true, it's completely unhelpful to tell somebody, right? It's the old saying, to have more money, you have to make more than you spend, right? Like it's a truth, but it doesn't tell somebody how to do it. And I like how that's where sort of the carbohydrate insulin model can fit in because it's trying to have a slight negative energy balance that doesn't lower your resting met metabolic rate and doesn't drive your hunger. Because those are the things that both physiologically and practically are going to just turn this energy balance model on its head and make it not work. Because if you're cutting your calories and you're driving your hunger, you're not gonna stick to it. If you're cutting your calories and your metabolic rate decreases, then physiologically, you're not going to be able to lose weight. So how can we cut our calories, have a slight calorie deficit in ways that don't do that? Well, a big part of that likely has to do with what's going on with your insulin. And that's where the carbohydrate insulin model and the energy balance model sort of comes together. That's sort of my words, my interpretation. Uh, the paper doesn't say it quite like that, but I like how the paper explores um, all the different concepts and, and options. And I hope to have Dr. David Ludwig back on the Diet Doctor podcast to go into this in, in greater detail. But I think the keys are it's calories and it's hormones and how those work together. As Gary Tobbs, who's one of the authors, has pointed out in, in his books, if you look at the, the biochemistry textbooks, the biochemistry of obesity is linked to insulin, no question about it. So our approach to obesity and, and curing, or treating obesity likely should also therefore be linked in some way to insulin. So it's likely that hormones affect energy balance and energy balance affects hormones. So they both are certainly interrelated. And that's where I think the energy balance and carbohydrate insulin come together. Now, interesting, there's also a big section about hyperpalatable foods. And I guess from my perspective, they sort of downplay the effect of hyperpalatable foods. And I've done you know, podcasts with Michael Moss and the, this concept of hyperpalatable foods, I, I'm a believer in, but it actually brings up a good concept, like hyperpalatable to who, right? They have scientists trying to study the bliss point and the, the texture and the crunch and all these things to get you to eat more, but some people may find these disgusting. And so why do some people not eat these at all and other people can't stop eating? It's it's clear there's there's individual variation there. But I think maybe the hyperpalatable foods have more to do with it than, than what they examined. But defining it is very interesting. How do you define, you know, ultra processed and hyperpalatable? But Dr. Ludwig also has done some studies showing that just carbohydrates by themselves can increase brain reward. So I think it has to do with those people who are more susceptible maybe to brain reward. Um, and that can be hardwired, it can be epigenetic, whatever the case may be. But without going too much into a rabbit hole in the hyperpalatable foods, I still think that plays a big role. And just availability, um, you know, what, your li what the rest of your lifestyle is like, how you prioritize food intake, um, if you're just eating at convenience stores, you know, all those things play into it too. So it's certainly, that's not 
that's not um, brought into the energy balance model, right? How you live your life and what your logistics of your life are don't have much to do with energy balance but they may be affecting your hormones because of the foods you choose to eat, maybe raising your insulin more, maybe driving your hunger more. And then of course, there's the whole protein leverage hypothesis as well, which plays into this. And we've done podcasts with professors Robinheimer and Simpson who came up with the protein leverage hypothesis. That plays into it as well because some high carb foods are going to be lower in protein and some higher protein foods are probably gonna be lower in carbs and are going to affect insulin a lot less. So that plays into it as well. And in this paper, they go through so many different aspects, the hormonal response to glycemic load, the insulin and tissue specific insulin sensitivity, tissue specific insulin sensitivity and fat storage, insulin glucagon and adiposity and insulin glucagon ratio, which is really interesting. And that might be part of why protein, although increasing insulin doesn't have the same hyperinsulinemic uh, effects and the same you know, hunger driving effects as other high insulin stimulating foods. So they, they really unpack a lot of details in here, but I guess my sum up, and, and it doesn't do it all justice, it might be a little too superficial, but it really is this sort of confluence of the energy balance model, carbohydrate insulin model, and protein leverage hypothesis. And it's not one of them wins and one of them is right and one of them is wrong. It's really factoring all of them together and putting that into our nutritional lifestyle, right? In our nutritional environment. And that's what drives either obesity, metabolic health, or the lack of, of those. And that that's where I think we need to really see the bigger picture and not say it's one model or the other. So again, hopefully I'll be able to engage some of these experts to have more detailed discussions on the Diet Doctor podcast. I, I, I'm staying saying it here to hopefully make it happen because these do deserve deeper discussions, but I want to give the authors credit for coming together, sort of coming across the aisles because maybe they didn't agree on everything and they're not in the same camp, but they thought it was important enough to say, let's explore the concepts of obesity, the different models of obesity, and see where we we, we can come together to solve this problem. I love that coming together to try and solve the problem. And that's what we're trying to do here at Diet Doctor as well. Um, So if you thought this was helpful, please give us the thumbs up. Uh, and the subscribe because we'll give you more videos uh, along these lines to try and help solve this issue. Um, And if you're a clinician looking for resources to help your patients with metabolic health and with low-carb living, we have a new program called Diet Doctor Pro or DD Pro designed specifically for you. So please go to dietdoctor.com slash DD Pro to learn more. Reach out to me individually because it's one of my pet projects that I really want to engage more clinicians to help more people improve their metabolic health, improve with healthy weight loss. Um, and improve their lives. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.